Okay, let's talk about trigonometry. This video is really barely going to scratch the surface of trigonometry. Hopefully it's enough of a refresher of things that you've seen before uh, to get you ready for calculus. So trigonometry is all about measuring the sides of a triangle. Um, you have your basic functions sine, cosine, and tangent that are written like this in mathematical expressions. The definition of these is based on a right triangle, so I'm going to go through that right now. Here's a basic right triangle. That means that one of the angles is 90 degrees. I've labeled one of the remaining angles as the angle A, and we'll talk about that here. If I take sine of that angle, if I use that angle as the input for the sine function, the output is going to be the ratio of the opposite side to the hypotenuse. So which side is the opposite side? Well, from the perspective of angle A, the opposite side is this one on the left, right? It's the one that's not even touching. The hypotenuse is always going to be the angle opposite the right angle, or opposite the, the angle that's 90 degrees. Uh, however, the opposite side is going to depend on uh, which angle you're talking about. Cosine of our angle is going to be the adjacent side over the hypotenuse, where the adjacent side uh, is the one that isn't the opposite or the hypotenuse, but it's the one that it's the one that the angle is touching that isn't the hypotenuse. By the way, the cosine comes from uh, taking the sine of the complementary angle. So the complementary angle to this angle A would be this the other angle on this triangle, the one up here. If we took sine of that angle, then the opposite side would be the one I have labeled adjacent, and the hypotenuse would be the same. So that's where cosine comes from. That's how we get adjacent over hypotenuse. You don't really have to worry about that. You can just think of cosine as adjacent over hypotenuse, but I think the uh, origin is uh, kind of interesting. Tangent of our angle A is the ratio of the opposite side to the adjacent side, which is, by the way, the same as just taking sine of our angle dividing and dividing that by cosine of the angle. Uh, you can see that by dividing opposite over hypotenuse by adjacent over hypotenuse and showing that you get opposite over adjacent. What this means is that whenever you see tangent of some angle, you can replace that with sine of that angle divided by cosine of that angle. That's your first example of a trigonometric identity. We'll talk more about those later in the video. Uh, why are these functions useful at all, by the way? Uh, well, if you can calculate them with a calculator, which a lot of calculators do nowadays, then if you have just a, tr a basic right triangle like this, you only have to know two things about this triangle in order to figure out the rest. So if you only know one of the angles, say that this is 50 degrees and that the hypotenuse is 9, or something like that, you can figure out the rest of the triangle uh, just using sine and cosine and calculating those in a calculator. For example, this side over here, the opposite side, is going to be 9 times sine of 50 degrees. And the, the adjacent side here is going to be 9 times cosine of 50 degrees. Um, so that's why trigonometric functions are useful. There's another way to interpret them and also define them, uh, which I'll go through now. This involves a circle, believe it or not. Uh, so here I have a circle. I'm going to label the radius as r. Forget about the triangle that I've drawn here for a second. My basic question is what are the x and y coordinates of this point on the circle that makes a certain angle with the x-axis, where the circle has a radius r. Um, well, think about this triangle with x and y in mind. This vertical side, well, that's just your vertical displacement from the origin, so that's going to be the y-coordinate. This adjacent side, to the angle a, by the way, the adjacent side is going to be your horizontal displacement, or your x-coordinate. So now we can think about this triangle using trigonometry and see if we can figure out what x and y are. If I took sine of the angle a, that's going to be the opposite side over the hypotenuse, that's y over r. And from there I can easily see that y is r times sine of a. So if you can calculate sine of, of the angle that your point makes with the x-axis, then you multiply that with r and you get the y-coordinate. So we're halfway there. Cosine of our angle is x over r. So that means that x is given by r times cosine of our angle a. So this is great, because now if you want to know the x and y coordinates of a certain point on the circle, all you have to know is the radius of that circle and the angle that the point makes with the x-axis. And you can use cosine and sine to find the x and y values. This also gives us a way to interpret cosine and sine values, uh, because if the radius here was just 1, then the x and y coordinates of any point on the circle would just be given by the cosine uh, and sine of the relevant angle. So that gives you a way to think about cosine and sine with relation to uh, coordinates on a circle. This also gives us a way to have values for cosine and sine for angles that are bigger than 90 degrees, because you can't draw a right triangle that has uh, one of the remaining angles being, say, 120 degrees. But you can find the x and y coordinates of that point on a circle, and so that's what you actually define for cosine and sine values. Um, before we look at the graphs of sine and cosine, I want to talk a little bit about radians, which is another way of measuring angles. Um, 
that differs from degrees. The reason we use radians is you get some really nice uh, properties of cosine and sine that are just not true if you're talking about a degree measurement. So we use radians for that reason. Um, I'll, I'll show you how radians are defined. You might think of this angle as 45 degrees. Um, the way that you think about this angle with, in terms of radians is you think about this part. How much of the circle are we actually describing? And the way you quantify that is how much of the circumference uh, is described by this angle. So if this circle has a radius of 1, then the circumference is given by 2 pi. So the actual measurement of this little arc of the circle is going to be 1 eighth of the total circumference, which means that the uh, the radian measure for that angle is 2 pi divided by 8, or 1 eighth times 2 pi, and that gives you pi over 4. So that's how you say 45 degrees uh, when you're talking in radians, is pi over 4, because that's the actual length of the arc that 45 degrees uh, describes. Uh, similarly, pi in radians is equal to 180 degrees. And that's because if you traveled halfway around the circle, or 180 degrees, you've described half of the circumference, which would be 2 pi divided by 2, or just pi. Some other common ones are like pi over 6, which is 30 degrees, and pi over 3, which is 60 degrees. Other ones that you often see are usually just multiples of these. For example, pi over 12 would be 15 degrees, which is just half of pi over 6. So that's basic radians. Hopefully that gives you an idea of what it means when you see an angle written in radians instead of degrees. Now we can look at the graphs of sine and cosine. You've probably seen these graphs before. You might not have even known that they were trigonometric functions. But they make these nice waves that I'm doing my best to draw symmetrically here. Um, and this makes sense when you think about the sine value being your y-coordinate as you travel around the circle, right? It starts off right at zero, if, if this is zero. It starts off at zero and then goes up, and then back down, and then back up again. And then that all repeats, because you're just traveling around the same circle. So you see that here. We go up, and then back down, and then back up again, and then it repeats. Uh, the period, which is how long it takes for this graph to repeat itself, is 2 pi, because that's the number of radians it takes to go all the way around the circle, and then you're just back where you started. The other important thing to note about this graph is that it only goes between 1 and negative 1. And that's not surprising, because if you're talking about a unit circle, you could never have a y-coordinate that is bigger than 1 uh, on that circle. So that's why it goes between 1 and negative 1. That's an extremely uh, important fact that you really need to know about trigonometric functions, is that they're restricted to negative 1 and 1. The same is true for cosine. Cosine looks just slightly different um, than sine. Uh, the starting value is different. It's just a translation. Um, and that makes sense when you think about the x-coordinate. The x-coordinate is at its maximum when you start out here on the end of the x-axis. And then it goes to the left or gets more negative and then gets more positive. And so that's where the cosine function repeats itself. You can also fill in x-values here. For example, when is the sine, uh, the sine value 0? Well, that's going to be at halfway around the circle or at pi. Uh, however, at pi, the x-coordinate is going to be negative 1. So that's when the x-coordinate is at its lowest value. Uh, for cosine. Um, so that's your basic graphs of sine and cosine. The most important things to know is that they are repeating or periodic with a period of 2 pi and that they vary between 1 and negative 1. Let's talk about inverse trigonometric functions. Um, these are often written in either one of these forms, sine with a little negative 1 here. That means the inverse sine function or arc sine. Um, what these do uh, for example, the input is now the y-coordinate and the output is the angle, or the input is the ratio of the opposite and the hypotenuse and the output is the angle. Uh, whereas the sine function, the input is the angle and the output is uh, either one of these two. Um, there's a little bit of a complication with inverse trigonometric functions with regards to the domain and the range, which is just the set of input values and the set of output values. The domain has to be between negative 1 and 1, right? Because the domain of the inverse function, or the input values, are just the outputs of the original functions, or the sine function. So since sine only goes between negative 1 and 1, you can only put values between negative 1 and 1 uh, as the input for the inverse sine function. There's also a problem, which is that, remember, to be a function, you can only give one output for every input. But if I ask to know the angle that I have to travel along to hit this y-coordinate, there are actually two angles that give me that. There's this one, and then there's this one that goes all the way here. Um, 
so there's a, I, I'm not going to go into detail about this because you don't really have to calculate arc sine values in calculus, but it's enough to be aware that there's going to be a little bit of a problem with the domain and range when you're talking about inverse trigonometric functions. Uh, there's also special values of sine and cosine that are worth memorizing. This is a good time to pause the video and memorize uh, this diagram you see here. This gives you the radian measures as well as degrees and gives you the x and y coordinates or the, sine, or the, the cosine and sine values respectively of those radian measures. Um, I'm going to finish off the video by just looking at some quick identities. I'm not going to prove any of these, um, but these are basic and important for you to know. Uh, sine squared plus cosine squared is always equal to 1. That comes straight out of the Pythagorean theorem. That's an extremely useful identity. Um, also, there's these double angle formulas, which are not nearly as easy to prove, um, but also very important. They'll help you simplify your way out of uh, some binds. There's also three more functions that you need to be aware of, which are secant, cosecant, and cotangent. These are just reciprocal functions where secant is 1 over cosine, cosecant is 1 over sine, and cotangent is 1 over tangent. You don't need to know nearly as much about these as you need to know about the basic functions, but you should recognize them and know that they're the reciprocals of the basic functions that you're familiar with. So sorry it's kind of a long video, but hopefully that's enough to refresh you on trigonometry. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.